and welcome to Rule of Carnage, a, a video series and sometimes podcast where we talk about the craft and art and, dare I say, science of making miniature games, tabletop miniature games, toy soldier games. Um, and Glenn Ford, uh, noted games designer, and me, Michael Hutchinson, games designer. I don't normally call myself Michael. How strange. Uh, Mike Hutchinson. We've been talking... Um, most recently about the history of war games um and uh i was recounting some of my um research in the early years from 1780 uh, and the first sort of evolution of war games from chess into the kriegspiel all the way up past uh the great war and the second world war to uh 1943 where fletcher pratt a, a science fiction author but also operator of giant uh, floor-based naval games, uh, which if you're watching on YouTube, you will have just seen a picture of in the opening of this video. Um, that's uh, when the first sort of proper wargaming book gets published, the first time uh, beyond H.G. Uh, Wells in uh, 1913. So uh, I guess the next phase, uh, and this will only be, this will be part two of two, we won't go further than this. The next phase that's worth talking about is um, Having had these early burbles in the Kriegspiel and uh, Robert Louis Stevenson and H.G. Wells, there's clearly some very niche interest in taking Britain's lead soldiers and other kinds of um, children's toys and turning them into uh, a game for uh, for chaps to play. And there's also some sort of history of then the developing thinking about how might you take the simulation of war and use it in a military context. And I'm not going to go deep into that because my research on that's fairly light. You get to um, you get to the beginnings of the sort of run up from the 50s into, I guess, what we would consider to be like the modern sort of war gaming and miniature gaming community. And I think I think where I'm going to start with that is that there's the beginning of um, there's the beginning of kind of community building around this in a big way so there's a thing called the war games digest which is like a quarterly fanzine and this thing is um you know it's printed this is like the early white dwarf it's like it's white pieces of paper with little hand-drawn illustrations and it's all been typed up because it's a fanzine but it's a fanzine made in like uh 1957 so it's just sort of gummed together and it's distributed to you know so something of something like a hundred subscribers or whatever and so um this like war games uh yeah it's what's his what's the chap's name scrooby is his name it's um scrooby. he's got 40 subscribers at the beginning um and it never exceeds 200 i think but it's based in the States and um, it begins to sort of evolve a small community of people who are exchanging letters and ideas about what making toy soldiers games might be like. And what I'm really delighted by is at this point in like the mid 50s, the late 50s, literally everyone that subscribes to this war games digest is essentially playing their own game. There's no game that everyone plays. They've all read hg wells and they've all got their own sort of variations and some of them are playing naval games and some of them are playing um you know games with toy soldiers and some of them are playing napoleonics and some of them are playing uh world war one stuff so already amongst like 200 players you've got this like fractured sort of community of people playing different things but everyone's a game designer like everyone has to design their own game there's nothing for them to play and so, uh, as I think you mentioned last time, Donald Featherstone, who's a Brit and a subscriber to the War Games Digest, um, gets it in his head that he's going to just try and write down what's going on here for the sort of for the uh, for the benefit of people who might want to get into it. He starts to write from kind of like um, from a from a cheery, friendly, avuncular point of view, like. What are these war games and how might one go about it? And so he writes, uh, where's my copy of it? He writes, he writes war games, Donald Featherstone's war games, which is uh, not showing up well on the green screen because it's also <laughs> green. Battles and maneuvers with modern uh with with model soldiers, sorry, 
And I don't know, like if you have played any war games in your life, I strongly recommend you pick up a copy of War Games by Donald Featherston because it's just a super delightful peer into some of the real beginnings of the hobby. And uh, Donald Featherston writes in this really like, I don't know, just extremely fun 60s way where it just feels like you're down the pub with some guy and you're both like, you know, 50 Marlboros in <laughs> and uh, you've got Pint of Mild. And so a lot of the stuff that he lays out here and in the subsequent books that he writes is sort of collections of rules that he's encountered. And so Tony Barth, who's a friend of his, who he plays with quite a lot, turns up because he's obviously a more... Um, I think he's a more thoughtful and sort of considered games designer than maybe Fen uh, Featherstone is, who's more of um, the enthusiast. And so what you get is a sort of each book has a set of rules where it's like, well, if you want to play Ancients or if you want to play Modern or if you want to play Napoleons, like here's some rules. And they're presented in very sort of practical terms. Um, and most of them involve dicing off and it's a four, a four or a five or a six to, to do a thing. And, you know, quite a lot of the rules, even the movement ranges and stuff are quite familiar to me as a sort of, you know, child of the of the 90s uh, wargaming. So what you see, I think, in Featherstone is uh, probably like both a reflection of what's going on in this in this 60s late 50s and 60s wargaming community but also i think an observer effect where by crystallizing his observations and putting them into a book that's now available i think that that crystallizes what other people begin to do and so i think i think that featherstone ends up really driving and influencing a lot of what comes after simply because he's now got a very accessible and easy to acquire book and so other people start to emerge. There's there's Charles Grant's Battle, which I can't recommend in anything like the same terms. He spends almost an entire chapter saying that um, saying that uh, infantrymen should walk uh, four inches or three inches, and then underlining that several times. It's the most bafflingly written book ever. Um, don't, don't pretend you don't find that delightful, because I know that you do. It's it's kind of amazing. It's kind of amazing. Like if you were going to write, if you were going to write a war game, but in the style of Charles Grant, it could be the simplest game that you like, and it would still be 120 pages long. <laughs> um, and what's this? This is like this is like 64 or something. Um, oh no, this is this is as late as 70. And then I talked about this on a previous um, uh, episode of Rule of Carnage. So this is uh, P. Dunn. Uh, writing in uh, seven, 1970 as well and he's writing about naval war games but I really enjoy the descriptions that he gives um, a bit like Featherstone of um, the rules that he presents being like here's something that's a way that you could approach it and here's some options that you could maybe explore and figure out how to incorporate into your rule system which of course you have in your own home um, but I think the other thing that's really exciting about reading through these old sort of they're not even rule books like books about wargaming is the number of intriguing ideas that they're that they're messing about with so in terms of resolution systems throughout these books you'll see like we draw pictures of the ships and we put a a, a nail a pin not quite in the center of a block of wood and then you have to try and poke the right bit of the ship in order to to strike a hit the yeah, sorry, the, the my absolute favorite one of the the these the sort of things you talk about here is from Naval War Games, the idea that each table can be an island and you can put your ships on like broom handles um that sit that, that sit on the floor and then you can move your ship from island to island and then you can put down stools and they can be like reefs and 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 then you have to like like smaller ships and it's like oh god i so want to make a war game that actually you know a modern game that uses that that is the most delightful thing i've, I've ever come come across in my life the idea of loading troops onto a ship on one table moving the ship across on its little broom handle thing over to the other table and unloading the, the troops on that other table to engage there it's there are some brilliant brilliant ideas just because they didn't know that there were rules you know that you couldn't break in many yeah ways. and and you're talking about this this 1965 mm. book naval war games and there's so much in this so here, here's a double page spread you can probably see like here you've got sort of movement template things and, and and ways of measuring the sort of shape of the base but this kind of stuff emerges again and again in other war games like here you've got little templates for the ships 
where as batteries get destroyed, you cross off the different cannon batteries. So like, because, um, because Featherstone's sort of re just reflecting what else is going on um, in the, in the, in the community, what you get in these books is just a real diversity of sort of fun experiments about what people are maybe trying to do. And they're sort of poking around and trying to see what, what can what can happen so like as students of game design as Glenn and I are like I just find it like it's like sort of inhaling a bunch of random indie rule sets all in one go that, I mean that I that I think is something that's particularly fascinating when I you know because I've just started really reading these Donald Featherstone sort of era books is it feels like there's been a sort of hourglass thing or a bottleneck or something that's gone on where at that point, there were these incredible ideas. And like you say, you know, there's this thing where you you mark off cat and ba cannon batteries as they get destroyed, which is so, you know, Pirates of the Spanish Main, the, the, the WizKids game, where you, you pull off a mast when you get destroyed. Mm. That's how many cannons you had. And it's like, it feels like we went for a little sort of bottleneck of only a few ideas and a few ways of playing miniatures games. And it feels like we're now coming back out to the other end of the hourglass where there are so many sort of interesting ways of dealing with these things. And it feels like they had it back then in the sort of, yeah, the sixties, the fifties and something happened in the seventies, eighties, nineties, where something got like pinched in for a little while. And I feel like we're coming back out of a, uh, you know, the golden age for board games has maybe not been a golden age for war games. Could be, um, could 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 be sort of assumed from that process. Um, and then, as a passing footnote, I will mention this book, uh, Solo War Game, a uh, wargaming by Donald Featherstone, which purports to be a book about how one might uh, engage in wargaming on by oneself. But some of the opening chapters are the most hysterically 60s things I've ever read, which are about like how you can um, conceal your hobby from your wife, how you, can how you can press gang your wife and children into accidentally providing random inputs to your campaign games. And then there's this thing here saying... Um, uh, the father figure syndrome when applied to solo wargaming has benefits that are twofold if you as a wargaming father have been gazing fondly upon your male offspring first as a dribbling baby and then through the years until now when he is a grubby militant urchin of some eight or nine summers have been picturing him as your ideal wargames opponent for the future then this system is going to bring tears of gratitude to your eyes <laughs> anyway uh read more donald featherston is the my larger point <laughs> it's it's the broader point there yeah so i mean like all this stuff is all this stuff is grand and i think like my i think my next my next query is to figure out what happened sort of between about 74 75 and through that period into like what we recognize as the sort of dawn of the modern era where you know warhammer first edition and you know the emergence of the of, of the chain mails and the Gary Gygaxes and all that kind of stuff. Like I need to figure out how to draw the the string together, which is why I'm I'm next gonna go off and read um a uh, a John Peterson book about um about Gygax. Although, uh, gentle readers, the um the next the next piece of reading probably I just got a copy of this Dice Man book. Oh yes, Ian Livingston's sort of first hand account. It's mostly a scrapbook filled with fun uh, pictures and stuff and like bits of the initial, um, uh, what's the pre, what's the magazine before Citadel? White Dwarf? Oh, Owl and Weasel. There's these oh. like, there's these like lovely photocopies of pages from out from the front pages from Owl and Weasel and so forth. But anyway, so I think that's that's the next stage is to uh, is to connect this Donald Featherston '60s stuff to uh, to how you get to the uh, how you get to this the first edition of Warhammer and uh, all the strangeness that that contains. Yeah, and the and then the plate and then the place where we come back out from the the, the dominance of things. Like right from that pinch that. point where we're back now in an explosion of ideas and indie games and all kinds of random stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose also some i guess somewhere around there in the 50s osprey are making uh cigarette books uh cigarette card books 
was that right? And not you know well, that's how Osprey originated. That uh, ah. you know, not making military, not making military stuff, but uh... no, well, because okay, so this is the the one little bit of history that I so you know the cigarette cut in cigarette boxes used to get cards that would have like. Um, uh, military planes or tanks or whatever on them right yeah i mean I, I i know about them pretty much only from seeing complete collections in pubs well osprey used to make the books that you slot those cards into ah. and and the book had a little piece of information about the given card so osprey found that they had a whole bunch of people who could write about the the history and the details of military vehicles on staff so they started writing books about historical vehicles and military vehicles and things of that nature and then they found out that war gamers were co-opting these books to add extra detail and flavor to their um historical war games so osprey started writing historical war games and so presumably somewhere in the 50s and 60s osprey is there making um cigarette card books because i'm pretty sure they died out by the by mm. the 70s so presumably that's where where this they were having their origin story in the background somewhere. Well, that's that's been an absolutely splendid uh, history of war games. Um, I would like to sort of talk. I, I think it's an interesting conversation to be had about some of the things that that came from those origins and and how they've affected our viewpoint of of games. But we are running to a, a very solid time on this chat, so we will probably, hopefully, get to that conversation next time we reconvene. Um, if you've been holding back on a favourite war game uh from the 1940s onwards to now because of what i said in the last video please tell us in the comments now's section. your time now is now is your golden opportunity to let loose and 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 bewail us for having left out your favorite uh 1960s war game author um do it in the comment section whilst you're in the comment section smash the like and subscribe buttons until they squeal and cry um meet us in the discord and tell us about your favorite um, game of this nature, what it is that you enjoy about those older games, the the freedom, the the sense of them being indie games before indie games was a term, all that all that lovely, good and splendid, squishy things. Um, hit us up on any method that you can reach out to us and get some kind of response. Uh, but for now, from me and Mike, who is about to go off do some solo war gaming and use his small children as random inputs on the tabletop, it's going to be a thank you and goodbye. So uh, thank you and goodbye. Bye. Of course, it may well turn out that your wife and daughter viewing with jealous eyes the undoubted enjoyment of your, so your son is getting from this responsibility that is being thrust upon him that will also wish to get in the act. Do not spurn them saying this is man stuff. Accept their offer. After all, isn't one volunteer worth two pressed men?